I have asked Daniel New to introduce our speaker of the evening. Daniel and Herb have a history, and I'm not going to tell it, but maybe he will. Okay, are we live? Well, we're not going to tell a lot about our history either, Herb and I. Actually, when I think of Herb Titus, I think that there is probably no finer example of the grace of God. When I talk to people around the country, and when I talk to Herb, when I do business with him, first of all, can you imagine that the grace of God could extend to a Harvard Law graduate? <laughs> How about an ACLU attorney? Who'd have thunk it? And if God can save him, there's hope for anyone. <laughs> if this guy, if grace is available to him, it's available to all of us. And that is a message that he carries around all the time. Here's a guy who graduates from Harvard and not just graduates, but at the top of his class, becomes an ACLU attorney, and goes forth and does battle with the forces of liberty on behalf of his cause, that he was raised in public schools and in college and in law school to go to battle for. And somewhere along the line, he ran into the grace of God and submitted himself to it, accepted it as a gift, and it really messed up his politics. <laughs> and I think that's a great story. And that's just sort of the summary of his life. But it was a continuation of his grace, of God's grace, to bring him into our lives and into our, both as a friend and as an attorney for Michael New. We could not have done what we've done so far without him. It would have been done far differently, I'm sure. And while it's true we haven't won, we have certainly stayed in the fight, for which we're grateful. And we know that victory belongs to God. Our duty is to obey. And that's a part of the whole grace idea, is that we are privileged to obey. Not that we have to, but we want to. And so we want to do what's right. And in the end, if we lose this case, we will say thank you, Father, just as, as if we win this case. We're going to be obedient in victory or in loss, but we're going to enjoy serving our Father, our Master, above all. And Herb Titus has been God's grace to us in that, and I think he's a grace to the whole movement for liberty in this country. I think you'll enjoy listening to him today. I'll give you Herb Titus. Thank you so much, Daniel. It is a joy for me to be with you this evening. I was talking to Henry earlier and, and I'd hoped to get here earlier, but uh, I took advantage of the fact that Cincinnati is only about three hours from Athens, Ohio, where our daughter and her husband and their ten children live. And my wife was not able to join me tonight, but Jonathan Robe, who's sitting up here in the front table, is our oldest grandchild one of 15, uh, for which we are very, very thankful. It is a real pleasure for me to be here. I have known Henry Lamb from afar for a long time, and when he invited me to speak, I was quite thrilled to respond and, and, and come, because I wanted to see up close what I had seen from afar. And I am not disappointed at all. As a matter of fact, Jonathan and I got here early enough to hear what's happening on several of the local scenes in America, and I'm very encouraged. And it's very important for you to be encouraged, because sometimes when you're in the battle in which you find yourselves, it's very difficult to be encouraged, because the forces that are against you are very powerful. But what's more important is to know that you serve a God who's much more powerful than those forces that are arrayed against you. I was talking to Henry earlier, and, and he was telling me a little bit of the history of how they came up with Freedom 21. And of course, if you look at the contrast between Freedom 21 and Agenda 21, you find that the root of that contrast 
is not accidental. But the root of that contrast can be actually found in contrasting provisions between the United Nations Charter, which is the fountainhead of Agenda 21, and the United States Constitution. If you're anything like I was when I was in law school, I studied constitutional law and never read the Constitution. It was only after I became a Christian that I, after been teaching constitutional law for many years, decided that maybe I ought to look and see what I've been teaching. <laughs> and I was absolutely amazed at what I discovered. And I want to start with you this evening with a provision of the Constitution that perhaps some of you have paid little attention to, or perhaps you've had a Constitution that doesn't even contain this particular provision. It's the subscription clause. It's the last provision of the Constitution. It is the clause that represents what our founders subscribed to. Listen to the language done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present the 17th day of September in the year of our Lord, 1787, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 12th, in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names. Now think of the Constitution as a Contract. It is a form of contract. It's actually a covenant. What if no one signed it? What if you had a contract in which the parties didn't sign it? Well, the most important part of a contract, if you're practicing law, is to make sure that the person who is presenting the contract to you, if there's a contract dispute, is that it's actually been signed. So it's important then to see that the subscription clause of this particular document is that which makes it legally effective. It's been signed, it's been witnessed to, it's been subscribed. And notice what it says. It says, in the year of our Lord, 1787, and the twelfth year of the independence of the United States. Now, Let's look at the Charter of the United Nations, and let's look at the subscription clause of the United Nations Charter. And it reads as follows. In faith whereof the representatives of the governments of the United Nations have done, signed the present charter, done at the city of San Francisco, the 26th day of June, 1,945. What's missing? Our Lord is missing. But it's even more significant than that. If you go back and look at that first sentence, in faith whereof. Now, what does that mean, in faith whereof? It's interesting that they were use the word faith, isn't it? In faith whereof? In faith whereof we speak. That is, in faith whereof we have written this charter. It is a faith in themselves and what they have done on that particular day. Let's go back and look at that subscription clause in the United States Constitution. It says, not only in the year of our Lord, 1787, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 12th. Now, if you count from 1787 back, you will find out that the 12th year that they're speaking of is dated back to 1776. And what is the 1776? But July 4, 1776, the charter of our nation. And if you look at the charter of the nation, you find some very significant references to that Lord that our founders were talking about when they said in the year of our Lord. 
First of all, if you look at the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, you find the words laws of nature and of nature's God. Likewise, if you look at the second paragraph, you see we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator. Once I was involved in a debate at a liberal college over in the western part of the state of Virginia. And I was taking the position that apart from the book of Genesis, you could not have the Declaration of Independence because it refers to all men are created and endowed by their creator. It doesn't say all men are evolved <laughs> and somehow acquire rights through evolution. It must be that our founders actually believed in the creation of account of the origin of man and of the universe as recorded in the book of Genesis. Well, on my left was Barry Lynn, who's now the head of the American Separation of Church and State, and he's poo-pooed that idea. And I said, well, do you have any evidence that Thomas Jefferson and those who subscribed to the Declaration of Independence didn't believe in the book of Genesis, and he didn't have any evidence. As a matter of fact, I had even more evidence. Thomas Jefferson once wrote a statute, 1786, it says, well aware that Almighty God created the mind free. And so I recounted several other instances of the word creator. As a matter of fact, religion in Article 1, Section 16 is defined this way. Religion are the duty that we owe to our creator. Where does this language come from? Well, not only did Barry Lynn not have any counter evidence, but neither did the liberal churchman, and then it was opened up to the audience, and some smart professor starts getting after me. How could Thomas Jefferson and James Madison possibly believe in the book of Genesis? And so I asked them, I said, well, do you have any evidence that they believed in evolution? And he didn't have any evidence. And then he said to me, I bet you believe in a literal Adam and Eve. And I said, yes, I do. A liberal arts college, I'm speaking to them, and I believe in Adam and Eve. Laughter, sarcastic laughter, went across the audience. And there Barry Lynn, by the grace of God, said this. He said, how do you know that James Madison didn't believe in Darwin's theory of evolution as written in The Origin of the Species? I said, that's easy. Madison died before he wrote the book. <laughs> Now, that was a very smart answer, but it was a very dumb question. <laughs> you see, when our founders referred back to the Declaration of Independence, they were referring back to that God who is the God of the law of nature, of the one who created the world and who put the world into existence, and not just as a deist God, as a theist God, that is, a Christian God, because if you read the last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence you will see that they not only believed in a creator, but they believed that this creator was the supreme judge of the world because they made their appeal to the supreme judge of the righteousness of their cause for independence. And then later in that same paragraph, they made their final appeal to divine providence because they knew they were going up against the mightiest armed force in the world at that time. How could this ragtag army win this battle for independence? But by divine providence. You know where that comes from. It comes from the book of Genesis. Abraham taking Isaac up to the mountain to sacrifice him as God has commanded him. And in a moment of time, a ram in the thicket, a substitute for his beloved son Isaac. And he laid the ram on the altar. And Isaac was returned to him. And that's where we learn of the name of God Jehovah Jireh, God, our provider. Now notice, if our founders were deists, 
you know, Dias just believed that there was a God who created everything and wound it up like a clock and then went off to create something else. But here in this last paragraph, they're appealing to God the creator as the supreme judge of the world. And then they make the appeal to God as provider, as the one who is both merciful and just. Where is the appeal in the United Nations Charter? Well, the United Nations Charter creates an international court of justice as a substitute for God, the supreme judge. If there is no God, then there is no supreme judge. So they've got to create a court of international justice to substitute for the supreme judge of the world. Do they believe in God's providence? Do they believe when they wrote that United Nations Charter that there was a God who would provide and meet every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus? The answer is no. They believed that they could determine that they would be the ones who would establish justice. Listen to this language of the preamble, which says, we the peoples of the United Nations determined. Now listen to this language. What did they determine to do? To save. Did you hear that? To save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. Have you been reading the newspapers lately? Have we been saved? from the scourge of war, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small. Notice once again, their faith is directed not to God, but their faith is directed to themselves. Listen to this, to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained. To establish conditions. It doesn't say, as the United States Constitution says, to establish justice. No, to establish conditions. And then listen to this one. To promote social progress and better standards of life in a larger freedom. You see, because they did not believe that God created the heavens and the earth, after all, it was 1945. By that time, the Darwinian theory of evolution had taken over not just the United States of America, but the world. They only could look to themselves and not to a higher power. And so they could not promise establishing justice as the preamble of the United States Constitution commits us. So two contrasting subscription statements, one expressing faith not only in God, but God of the Bible, the God of the Holy Scriptures, the God who has created us, the God who has redeemed us. And the other subscription clause to man, to know God. A subscription that we can save ourselves. Well, let's look at that preamble a little more closely. Let's look at the contrast between the preamble of the United Nations Charter as contrasted to the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. Listen to these words from the United States Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. A dedication of a document 
that is designed that this perfect union, this more perfect union, would be governed by the law written in this document. As a matter of fact, Chief Justice Marshall in 1803 said this about this written constitution. He said, it was contemplated by the people who wrote the constitution that it would be the law that governs those who govern. It was designed that we would be ruled by law because the governors would be under the law, not above the law. Now, I must say, today's United States Supreme Court doesn't believe that. The United States Supreme Court today says that what we say is law. But that was not what Chief Justice Marshall said in Marbury and Madison in 1803. He said that this instrument, which was contemplated by our founders because it was put in writing, would govern the court the same as it would govern Congress and the President of the United States. You see, that preamble was a commitment to the rule of law, that the governors would be governed by the law written down in this Constitution in Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, Article 4, and so on. Let's look at the means by which the United Nations Charter is to be enforced. Remember the purposes to save, to reaffirm faith in human rights, to establish conditions to promote social progress. Listen to this language. And for these ends, to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors. Isn't it interesting that they use the word tolerance as contrasted to the word liberty? You see, tolerance is not liberty because tolerance is that we will tolerate you as long as we want to tolerate you. Liberty is a very different principle than tolerance. It's God-given, just as it states in the Declaration of Independence that our liberties are given by God and governments are instituted among men to secure the God-given right of liberty. But listen to this in the United Nations Charter. To unite our strength to maintain international peace and security. Notice, that's not an appeal to law. It's appeal to power, to unite our strength. Listen to this, to ensure by the acceptance of principles and the institution of methods that armed force shall not be used, save in the common interest. Save in the common interest. Now turn over with me and I'll look at this one a little bit more carefully. In Article 2, Paragraph 7 of the United Nations Charter says this, Nothing contained in the present Charter shall authorize the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state, or shall require the members to submit such matters to settlement under the present Charter. But... This principle shall not prejudice the application of the enforcement measures under Chapter 7. <laughs> and if you turn over to Chapter 7, there are several provisions of Chapter 7 that I could read to you, but let me just read you one from Article 51. Nothing in the present Charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. Measures taken by members in the exercise of this right of self-defense shall be immediately reported to the Security Council and shall not in any way affect the authority and responsibility of the Security Council under the present Charter to take at any time such actions as it deems necessary in order to maintain or restore international peace and security. What is it saying? It's saying the United States of America, you have the right of self-defense until the Security Council steps in 
and then it's the Security Council who decides whether or not you're defending yourself. It's the Security Council who decides whether or not any particular nation in defending its borders is acting in self-defense. You see, this is not the rule of law. This calls for a rule of strength. And listen to this one. To employ international machinery. I'm not getting it. That's what it says. To employ international machinery for the promotion of the economic and social advancement of all peoples. You see what you have in contrasting the preamble of the United States Constitution, which says to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity, laying down a rule of law that governs the governors. Instead, in the preamble to the United Nations Charter, you have an appeal to power, not to the rule of law. So contrasting the subscription statements, we see an acknowledgement of God as the sovereign ruler of nations in the Declaration of Independence, because after all, the laws of nature and of nature's God upon which this nation is founded, those terms mean this. The law of nature means this. God's will revealed in nature. God's will revealed in nature. And the law of nature's God is God's will revealed in the holy scriptures. We are a nation founded upon God's revealed will in nature and in the Bible, the holy scriptures of God. A nation founded upon the law of God as contrasted to a United Nations founded upon superior force. What a contrast between the commitment of this nation to the rule of law and the commitment of the United Nations Charter to a rule of force. But it doesn't end there. Let me take you to the contrasting provisions of ratification. If you remember, the preamble of the United States Constitution says this. It says, we the people of the United States. We the people of the United States, affirming that it was the authority of the people to constitute the government. Where does that come from? But from the Declaration of Independence, which says what? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unamiable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now listen to these words. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now notice what the Constitution is designed to do is to bring to reality that principle. We the people of the United States, we the people who have the authority to constitute the government that will govern us. Why? Because governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Well, how do you obtain that consent? If you go to Article 6, I'm sorry, if you go to Article 7 of the United States Constitution, you will find how and by what method the consent of the governed was to be obtained. The ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution between the states, so ratifying the same. Now, what does that mean? That means that this Constitution would not be legally binding upon any state of the United States of America unless a convention was held to which representatives of the people, elected by the people, are sent for the sole purpose 
of determining whether or not to be governed by this written document. Now notice, that's not like a legislative election, is it? When you wrote, write, vote for a legislator, there are many issues that come up in an election. But you see, this was a single issue campaign. It was for the sole purpose of determining whether the United States of America would be governed by this written document. And so each of the 13 original states held a special election whereby representatives of the people were chosen for the specific purpose and only purpose of determining whether this constitution would govern the United States of America. Now, let's go back to the United Nations Charter. It starts out the same way, doesn't it? We, the people of the United States, determined. But let's go to Chapter 19, the Ratification Clause. Article 110, paragraph 1. The present charter shall be ratified by the signatory states in accordance with their respective constitutional processes. When the United Nations Charter was submitted to the people of the United States, did the people of the United States get an opportunity to vote for representatives for a convention to decide whether or not they consented to this charter to govern them? The answer is no. It was submitted to the Senate for their ratification as if it were a treaty rather than what it really is, a constitution for world government. It was originally designed that way. It was originally conceived as a constitution for a united nations of the world. And it began, we the peoples of the United Nations, but it didn't end with a ratification provision to determine whether the governed consented to be so governed. Today we hear a lot of talk about reforming the United Nations, as if the United Nations was somehow okay in the beginning, but has become something other than it was conceived to be. The answer is no. The answer is this, that this charter of the United Nations is not just a charter that is a treaty between nations, but it is a constitution and it's an illegitimate constitution and needs to be revoked and repealed. <laughs> to that end, Congressman Ron Paul for several years has been introducing a statute to restore the sovereignty of America to get the United Nations out of the United States and the United States out of the United Nations. And he should be encouraged to continue to press for that resolution because the United Nations Charter is incompatible with freedom. It is based upon an assumption that there is no God. And we in America know that apart from God, there is no liberty. Indeed, as Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and other Virginians in my adopted state of Virginia once wrote, that the first freedom is the freedom that God gives us to believe to speak that which God impresses upon us and that 
the civil government has no jurisdiction over our hearts and our minds. You know, if the Jefferson and Madison legacy were put into effect in America today, there would be no government school system. For as Thomas Jefferson said, to compel a man, to support the propagation of opinions with which he disagrees, is both sinful and tyrannical. It's both contrary to God's law, and because it's contrary to God's law, it's contrary to a free government and a free people. What's important for us to understand is that if you look at the two subscription clauses, and we see one subscribing to God as the sovereign ruler of heaven and earth, that that's the very fountainhead of liberty. And if you don't have a subscription clause that acknowledges God as that fountainhead, there can be no liberty. And if you look at the contrasting preambles, you cannot have a nation governed by law unless you acknowledge the law of nature and of nature's God. God's will revealed in nature and God's will revealed in the Holy Scriptures. And the United Nations not only doesn't acknowledge that, but actually establishes a system that is contrary to the rule of law. And finally, the contrast between the ratification clauses of the two documents. Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. May I encourage you, because you are on the front line, you are people who recognize that without God there is no liberty, and that if we do not go back to the foundations of this country that we have spoken about this evening, then there will cease to be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. But by God's grace and by God's leading and by God's strength, I encourage you in your communities and across the country to continue to fight for liberty. Freedom 21, the rallying cry for liberty for the people of America in this 21st century. God bless you and Godspeed. Thank you very much, Herb. That uh, was inspiring as I knew it would be. Now we are approaching the end of another session, and I want to remind you that Constitution Week is the week of September 17th. Make sure you have a supply of constitutions and the DVDs, A More Perfect Union, and do everything you can to get it into your schools your churches, your civic clubs, and let's continue to promote the Constitution. Now, before we have our benediction, I look out across the crowd, and on behalf of all of the sponsors of Freedom 21 campaign, I want to sincerely thank you for the work you do. You are the people who make the difference. You are the soldiers in the field. You are the ones who do the persuading. You are the ones who will save this country. And we thank you for your work and for your effort. Now, we have asked Greg to do a number of things at this conference. He's a very talented gentleman as I'm sure you will all attest. So we have asked him to do the benediction using still another of his many talents. I've had the privilege of singing this across the world, but never more important than today in my view. 
A third verse that's not heard very often, but should be familiar to most of you, goes like this. Oh, thus be it ever, when free men shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that has saved and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must, when our cause, it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. May the star-spangled banner forever in triumph wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave. I'd ask you to stand with me, please, as I present along with the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra our national anthem. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous?